You are now listening to the Breakthrough Basketball Coaching Lab podcast. Here's your host, Jim Huber. Welcome to episode number eight, where we'll be discussing how to develop a good practice plan that helps get players to buy into your program. I'm excited today to have on Willie Williams as our guest. Willie is the athletic director and head men's basketball coach at Nebraska Christian College, where he has been named three-time NCCAA Region Coach of the Year, as well as playing in three national tournaments. Willie, it is great to have you on the coaching lab. Uh, thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And uh, this is something that I think a lot of coaches struggle with, is developing practice plans. Mm. And not only just one practice plan, but the idea of maybe practice plans throughout the year that yep. build up, you know, the players and the team with kind of their concepts, what they have to succeed, not only early, but may, mainly later in the year. So yep. let's get into when you look at practice plans and say at the college level and you're going into 2019, 20 of next year, do you mm-hmm. look at like how many practices you're going to have in total and kind of then build it from that? Like bring it like this is going to be end of the season. This is our start to so many practices we have, and you start from there. How do you go about it? Yeah, you know, and uh, from the college level, I mean, we start Labor Day. You know, so this year I believe it's September second, and uh, we don't finish till the middle of March. Uh, we only have two uh, two weeks off there: a week for Thanksgiving and a week during Christmas. And so that's just a lot of wear and tear and work uh, for our student athletes, uh, both from a mental standpoint, but also from a physical standpoint. So when I'm looking at practices for the whole year, you know, we, we, we're taking into effect, what's that look like as far as how their body's going to respond? Um, you know, and so we're looking at the, the perceived, um, you know, when we're, we're looking at like, you know, what's their perceived uh, energy rate, you know, what they're doing there. Um, we take a look at where they're at skill-wise, you know, and where we want to be. I mean, obviously every team wants to be peaking, uh, second semester and right towards they get to the, the playoffs and everything. And so, um, you know, we take a look, a lot of look at just like how are their bodies respond to what we're doing. And so I don't necessarily look at how much total practice is. It's more assessing like where do we want to be, you know, as far as a technical and tactical uh, area. And then uh, how are their bodies responding to that so that they're still in peak performance? Because, I mean, we've had teams, you know, they get to that end and they're just physically exhausted. You know, they've done practices every day. They're physically exhausted. And then also the mental side. I mean, I got players that they could be feeling really good physically, but what's that look like uh, when they get to um, mentally? I mean, you give them a day off mentally, and they're just like completely re-energized uh, for the next practice, the next yeah. game. We try to just look at the holistic view when we break it down, and for us, it's obviously preseason, end season, and then postseason. So, so what? What? Let's go at the beginning of the season, like before games even start. I'm sure the practices at that point are a little bit longer, right? Are you going like? Two hours, two and a half, three hours. What are you usually doing at the beginning of the season? You know, honestly, uh, my practices stay about the same. It's exactly about two hours and 15 minutes. Um, we do a good uh, warm-up at the beginning, a dynamic warm-up that takes about uh, 14, 15 minutes. We do uh, and then about a seven to eight-minute cool-down at the end. And so that really is only leaving us with about an hour and 50 minutes of actual practice time. And so I believe in uh, quality uh, over quantity. And mm-hmm. so we really try to get it in. It's almost like it's, it's a different – it's the rate – of exertion that we really uh, uh, apply to the types of practices in that time. So like in the beginning in that uh, preseason, they're probably getting a seven, eight, even nine RPE because we're, we're, we're pushing them pretty hard during that time. It's a lot of uh, fast paced, get up and down, uh, full court type of stuff, uh, conditioning, a lot of conditioning built in the drills where when you get in the middle of the season, you know, we have three games in one week. It's a lot of half court stuff. Um, it's a lot of just, you know, more like walkthrough type things. Uh, it's less of that, you know, physical exertion. And obviously, as you get into the postseason, uh, it's very similar to that. So, Well, let's go back and let's talk about the beginning of the season. Two, two hours, 15 minutes. Let's, let's uh, break a practice down. So you said yep. the first, like, you know, 10 to 12 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, is going to be kind of dynamic stretch, right? So yep. what does yep. that look like? Do you have a coach that's leading that? Do you have, uh, uh, you know, some of your leaders and players that are leading your dynamic stretch? And what would I – run me through like a dy- dynamic stretch and what you would do in practice to get the kids ready for, the, for you know, practice at a high level. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and the whole point of a dynamic – understand the whole point of a dynamic stretch is to get the body prepared for what they're about to do physically. Um, and so that's getting your heart rate up. That's mimicking different uh, motions and movements you're going to do so that your muscles can be ready to go and your heart rate's up as it pumps bloods and gets it going. And so um, you ask me who runs that, it depends on the year. 
Uh, two years ago, I had 15 freshmen and only three upperclassmen, so there was a coach out there running every second of that. Um, you know, this last year, I had some really strong leaders, and so we really, I mean, they, they ran that all themselves, you know, and so typically, uh, the stretch looks like, you know, we do, I'm a big fan, you know, we do two laps around the gym, uh, and then we get right into the different dynamic stretches that you can do that we go sideline to sideline. You know, and that usually takes about a good 10 minutes uh, doing different dynamic movements. You know, it's getting them active, getting the heart rate up. Um, oh, and I guess I forgot. We do a – right after the two laps, we do a jump rope uh, routine. Um, a big so what is your jump rope routine? Is it, what do you do in that routine on your jump rope routine? Uh, it's three minutes long. Every 30 seconds they switch it up, which so is different things. You know, we have different – just your regular jumps. Uh, we have your skier. You have your one leg of each side. Uh, your Nordic. I mean, just different types of jumps. It's almost like a dot drill. It's almost like an eight, eight step dot drill, uh, but it's just right there with the jump rope to be getting that going. And then we finish with uh, double jumps. You know, I mean, typically I'm a big fan of conditioning. You could jump rope for 10 minutes, and a lot of athletes actually can't do that straight because of just the intensity that that requires. Uh, so we use about three minutes of that to get us our heart rate up as well before we get into our dynamic stretch. Now, your dynamic stretch, are you doing movements that translate into the games? Like you'll see people that do dynamic stretch where it'll be like, uh, you know, kind of like crossover steps or do lunges yeah, that will like the, the all that kind step of stuff. attack or they'll do – uh, you know, even like Euro step movements and stuff like that. What are you doing in your dynamic? Yeah, so again, depending on the sport, your dynamic stretch should look a little bit different depending on what sport. I mean, our dynamic stretch should look different than a dynamic stretch for football or maybe even tennis, you know, something like that. Uh, it's exactly what you're saying right there. I mean, it's like we're doing different quick step movements um, to where we're going to mimic maybe like a somewhat, almost so much like a closeout or a side step or, you know, where, where we close out and we have to turn and recover. You know, little step, but we just break it down to where it's literally only like two or three type steps, and it's quick, explosive movement to be able to get us warmed up like that. Um, and so then we actually have a closeout drill we do as part of our dynamic stretch. Again, just to start to get that blood flow and to start to get that those movements going. And then we end with about a two-minute static stretch. Uh, there's, there's a lot of research that says you shouldn't do a static stretch at the beginning because of the elongating of muscles. Uh, but for us, certain muscles actually perform better. When you do when you do long game at the beginning, which muscles, muscles you referring to? Like when somebody asks, like what muscles you referring to that you feel like doing a static stretch helps with the performance? Definitely, definitely. So we're, I mean, the big ones gonna be the quad, uh, the hamstring, and the calf. You know, and so we do elongate those muscles at the beginning uh, in the center of the core, um, and we hold them for a good, you know, 15, 20 seconds. Usually, guys count there, and then we do it twice through actually to make sure we're getting a good stretch in those. Because when you see a lot of those uh, injuries, but a lot of it because they're so tight. I mean, mm -hmm. you can refer back to like Chris Paul. You know, last year, game six, game seven, he only sat out in the Western Conference Finals because I mean, he pulled his hamstring. Now, again, I'm not saying he didn't stretch. I'm saying we're trying just to prevent as much of those types of injuries as possible. So after dynamic stretch, then what does your practice look like? What's the next thing you kind of get into? Yep, definitely. About the next like 27, 28 minutes is a lot of just fundamental stuff. I always start with some type of um, get up and down drill. That could be anything from like a five man weave, uh, a three on two, two on one, a baseline touch. You know, we'll work on our uh, even a press, you know, to kind of get the energy going. We'll start right out there. We got three teams. We're going five minutes straight of just constant, just we're pressuring you full court. And so the whole point of that is just to get the blood flowing, to get up, to get pretty much energized for practice. You know, I mean, it, it, you want to be able to catch your second win when you're done with that. So it's a very up-tempo type. Uh, then we've got to break it down. We do uh, shooting drills. Uh, we do ball handling and passes. To me, those are just the three fundamentals of the game. And so we try to, even if we only have three or four minutes to be able to do that, we try to break that down every single day, uh, whether we're in season, preseason. Those are, that's the basic. And then we do position work. So give an example of like, say, a shooting drill, like on a shooting ball handling, you know, say like passing, what would be like a drill on a particular yep. day of practice, what you do? Yep. So we have a couple of them. It depends on the point of what we do. So I believe they're shooting for quantity where you just want to get a lot of shots up. So we'll do that. And I believe there's then shooting uh, for your offense, you know, and so when we're just shooting for like, you know, quantity, you know, you got your basics like circle shooting, you know, we have a Larry Bird drill where you just get a ton of threes up. There's Duke shooting where we break up into two teams and they have to make a hundred threes. Uh, whoever team makes the most threes or, or makes the 100 threes first wins. I mean, that's just a lot of quantity. We didn't do a four-corner shooting drill, which we do a lot of motion. So we're doing a lot of cutting, uh, a lot of slipping, uh, back cuts, uh, screening, you know. And so we do a four-corner drill. We have two passes up top and uh, guys in the corners, and they get a down screen. 
you know, are pinned down. And then, you know, they have different things they do where we have to hit the slip man, where we have to hit the curl, the flare, all kinds of different things like that. Um, and so, again, those are the two different types of shooting drills we try to get, depending on what we want to work on. So we'll switch it up each day. Uh, passing, very same. You know, into those drills, actually some of the passing drills go with the shooting drills. So we want to really hit them in the shooter's pocket. Can't tell you how many times I'm watching them. These guys are catching the ball at their ankles or catching them up by their head. They're not able to get a good shot off. So we really try to work on, you know, angles of passes. And then also drive and kick, which is a big part of our, our motion. So. so do you do on those drills when you do it, do you, do you, does it all like group kind of like no defenders? Or do you also do like, you know, kind of a one on oh, two on oh, whatever it is. And then you put defenders on it to make it a game like type situation. We got to make decisions or what do you do on that? Yeah, definitely. So um, again, practices, you know, we try to get away from where a guy just lines up you got deep lines of eight guys standing around a lot, and then they get one rep in. We try to make it to where it's very up-tempo, where it's mimicking what they're going to get in a game. So we do a lot of one on o and then we put them in a game-like situation. Where we may even break it down to a quarter of the court where they're almost playing two on a two-man game where maybe it's a pick-and-roll type, but it's two-on-two. Two. But we always start out with like a two-on-o just so they can get a feel of what that looks like going on the left side, the right side, and then we always try to make it game-like with different scenarios, whether it's no dribble, whether it's you got three dribbles where the ball has to get inside, I mean, different things like that, you know. So where we work on, for example, you know, we'll do what's called split the post, where we have three guys. We have a post player and two guys outside. The guy will pass it inside the post, and he has to go set a way screen, so then we're splitting off. So then someone slips to the post, and then the other guy flares out, which just allows for, again, that just mimics our motion offense. We're getting shots up, and we're working on what that scenario looked like in a game. I think that's what key too, as you mentioned, is like you, there's so many drills you can do. I mean, okay. it, there's a ton of basketball drills, but I think as a coach, you got to figure out, okay, what, what offensively, what do we do? Like you said, are we running motion? Are we running like a UCLA cut? Are we running dribble drive? Are we running a flex offense? What is it? Because there's certain shots that kids are going to get right in the game out of that offense or certain mm -hmm. situations that um, when they're attacking from certain areas, they got to make reads. So put them in those positions where they're getting reps in against game-like situations that when it comes to game, it's like they've been there because they've done it in practice. And it sounds and, like you know, that's, and actually, that, that's really key. You know, I had a player uh, three years ago, uh, man, he was one of our hardest workers in practice and on his own. He'd always get in the gym, but unfortunately when he got in the gym, he wanted to be, uh, you know, he, got, he worked on NBA moves, which is a lot of one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. type things. And in a motion, you have that within the motion, but it's not, we don't play a ton of isolation if that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's like yeah. I make a move to be my defender so I can either get a look or get someone else a look where I'm not dribbling four or five times, six times like Kyrie Irving type to break you down and get a, to get a bucket. So he was always working on those types of moves, you know what I'm saying? And it didn't translate into our system because that's not our system. Yeah. And so it was really tough for him to see the court. He just didn't understand. I mean, he come to me and say, hey, coach, I don't understand why I'm not getting minutes. I'm, I'm, work, I'm harder, working hard anyway. I was like, yeah, you're, working, you're not working on things that make you better for what the style of play that we play. You know, and so it's big. We try to mimic that in practice. So they're getting reps that represent what they're going to get in a game, um, uh, game-like situations, uh, so that you know they're ready to go. Because I mean, you can have the best player, but if he doesn't, you know, all he wants to do is drive and kick, drive and kick. That's only one aspect of motion. That if he doesn't know how to go off the screen or make a cut, it really kind of negates yeah. his. Skill. I think it's so important for kids that, like you said, to understand. It's like here's what we do offensively, and here's where you're going to get your shots from. And outside yeah. of practice, here's some things you could work on, right? That that can help you get better. Yes. In these areas, so when it's game time, you're going to be successful in that. Instead, like I said, working, it's almost mistaken activity for achievement. You're in the gym, right. but you're working on things that don't translate over right. to what you're going to be doing in, in the game-like situation. So right. you, when you get done, so dynamic, you get into kind of skill development work and making it kind of right. some small side of games and that. A after that, then what do you get into? You know, and then we run offense, defense. Uh, so we'll do another, you know, 30 minutes or so, 25 minutes of offense where it's the same thing. We may do five on zero. Uh, we may do even three on three to try to, you know, maybe we want to work on our weave or something like that. I mean, we try to break it down. And then it's if we finish with five on five trying to, trying to get uh, our offense going. Um, but really it's just like breaking it down to start out with. Um, we even do we do a lot of quarter court if that kind of makes sense. So we'll do left side, right side because we believe. I mean, there we what's it look like when the ball's on the right side and you got two other guys, three other guys on the weak side, and we don't, we just don't like them just standing there. So just really trying to break that that down for them 
offensively. And then really we do the same thing defense. We run a, you know, a lot of, it's popular right now. We run that pack line defense, you know, Virginia uh, style. And so, you know, gap defense. And so we really, the same thing. You know, what's that look like? Cause that's a ball center defense versus a man center defense. And so how do we, what's that look like when my man doesn't have the ball? You know what I'm saying? How am I able to guard my man and the ball at the same time? And so those take up the, probably the next almost hour or so that we're really breaking it down, doing one-on-one stuff, two-on-two, and then we finish with five-on-five five there within those drills. So, that, again, they can see it. It's one thing if you drill, 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 but if you never apply it to a game, then it's hard for these kids to try to translate it. Yeah, you know, that's, that's what like. Tra- translate to a game, that's your whole purpose. Yeah, and it sounds like defensively you're working on it daily, you know, making right. it like this is an important part of what we're doing. I'm sure it's, you know, defense, rebounding, things like that. and. Do you do a lot of like shell type work and in situations you know, that It's funny because I had a player come up to me the other day or this last year. He's like, Coach, can we do something else besides shell? And I was like, Hey, if you can give me something else that's going to give us the same results as shell, then I'm totally open to that. But shell, it's nice. You do three on three shell, four on four shell, five on five shell. We've, we've done even where we've done, depending on who we're playing for, we'll do five on seven shell. I mean, just really yeah. just trying to trying to break it down. And so it's a lot of shell and there's so many variations out of shell that you can get that really help them. And we always do it with a whistle. So it's live. Then with the whistle, meaning when I blow a whistle, it's free. So we can actually explain so they can see here's what you did well, or here's what you need to do better in that situation. So it's funny. So, cause, uh, uh, you know, a guy that I know, he's the head coach at uh, Northwest Missouri state, Ben McCollum, and they've won two national championships in the last three years. And he's big on the defensive end. I mean, they're, they have a great program. But I asked him, I'm like, do you work on defense on a daily basis? Like, every day. Every day we work on defense. So I go, do you, what do you do defensively? Because we do shell every day. Every day. every day. And we'll do a we'll do a wrinkle out of it. We'll change it up each day. It'll be something maybe different. But we are going to defend every day and work on shell. And, you know, like I said, he's won two national championships in three years. And they're really good defensively. So, uh, it, it works. And I see a lot of coaches sometimes, like, we're not very good defensively. Well, you don't work on it. You don't, you don't, you know, if you don't stress and work on it, you're not going to be great at that. You know, what convinced me was, uh, I remember back in the day, was that maybe 2006, 2007, somewhere around there, the Phoenix Suns, back when they had Steve Nash and Mario Stoudemire, Sean Marion, those are, and even, even, you know, Dan Tony came out with a book called Seven Seconds or Less, you know what I'm saying? They, they could score that ball. Yeah, they could. The reason I believe they didn't win a lot of championships is because they couldn't defend consistently, you know, and uh, I had the privilege of being able to win it regional championship but national championship as a player and you know in that national championship game we were getting I think we had three shot clock violations you know which is kind of a big deal in the championship game it's demoralizing for the team and so I'm just a big fan of defense and I believe that offense is skill defense is effort and so if you can bring that consistent effort every night we could be shooting 30 percent we should still be in that game and have an opportunity to, to win that game well, that's the other thing like I tell like I, I so with the final four this year when I had like Texas Tech and Virginia in it, and yeah. Michigan, great defensively, and, and Auburn. But I, I have buddies when I got to the Final Four games, and I'm, I'm really like, you know, the defense in the floor, I really believe it. I mean, it's like we're going to be great in that end. And they're like, oh, you got to be so excited. I mean, for Virginia and Texas Tech mm-hmm. in the final. And, yeah. and, and I was because, like, when you see teams, I always believe this, defense travels. And as you talked yeah. about, it's like whether you're away, home, whatever, and you might not be shooting that well, but if you're yep. guarding and you're defending – you give yourself an opportunity. And you hear a coach will say a lot of times, be like, we didn't shoot it well. well okay, you didn't shoot it well. But if you really yeah. guard and you really defend, even if you don't shoot it well, you still give yourself an opportunity to be in a position to be successful on the scoreboard. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so after the, you get into that aspect of practices, do you then go into some full court transitional type stuff, five on five, or what do you do? After that, yep, yep. The last, the last uh, 15, 17 minutes, somewhere around there, depending on what you have left. Uh, sometimes we have twenty, just depending on what we need to work on. Is it's all it's full court and it's it's scenarios is what we do. You know, so give I me mean, some scenarios that you that you. Uh, you know, so we'll do. I mean, we'll do some long scenarios. You know, for example, you know, uh, six minutes left. Uh, my we're down. You know, uh, double digit points. We're down twelve points. Uh, we're shooting one on one, um, going against the team. And the, the team we're going against is typically who we're going to play, you know, so they, they do their stuff, whether they're pressing or whether they're a zone or something like that. So, yeah, we may be down 12 points, shooting a one-on-one, um, and then we just go from there. We play the last six minutes of that game out. And uh, obviously my, my guys are expected to come back and, and be able to compete to, to win those last six minutes, you know. Uh, we'll do another scenario where it's three minutes to go in a game, and, uh, you know, we have a, a seven-point lead. 
Um, you know, but we, we kind of mimic that we're on the road type. And so, I mean, we're not getting a lot of calls, mm-hmm. uh, yep. you know, typically. And so, you know, uh, I mean, they, they reach, we blow, we, we blow the whistle. They, they shoot, they're shooting too. We're not in the bonus yet. And so we just try to give as many game like scenarios uh, for them. So when we are in those situations in a game, uh, they can, they can be able to react to that. You know, we'll even do where, you know, there's 12 seconds left in the clock. The other team is shooting a one-on-one. Uh, we're a tie ball game. I have no more timeouts. All right. So what are we going to do in that situation? You know, so it, it's really just giving them an opportunity because at the end of the, end of the day, and I love it. I read, uh, reading Phil Jackson's uh, book called, uh, you know, uh, 11, 11 rings, the soul of success. And he talked about, you know, the NBA rule was you take, you take, uh, uh, after six points, you're supposed to take a timeout. And he said he used to, he just did not do that. Cause he's like, the players need to figure it out. So what we try to do is in practice is give them an opportunity to experience it. So when we get to a game, they get to make a lot of those decisions. So you're not, they've already experienced it. You know, it's not, it's not new to them. You know, it's, the moment is they're ready for that moment. So. So when you get done with your situational play at the end of practice, you do something fun before you get in a static stretch or you just kind of go right from there in a static stretch? What do you do? Uh, it depends. Um, it just kind of depends. You know, I'm a big fan of pressure free throws. So, you know, I'll pick. I'll let them pick free throws. You know, obviously if you miss free throws, you owe me a down and back. Um, so we do a lot of that. We will do explain, something. Explain pressure free throws to somebody that's listening that maybe doesn't understand it. Yeah, definitely. So what happens is uh, everyone lines up on the baseline, and I'll pick someone, and uh, they get to go up there, and they shoot uh, one-on-one. And uh, obviously, if you miss the first one, it's two down and backs. Uh, you miss the second one, it's one down and back. And uh, if you get both of them, depending on you know where we're at in practice, sometimes it'll just be one person has to do it. And if they hit both of them, practice is done. We go right into static. Sometimes I go through the whole team. It just depends. You know, they just have to be ready to go, and I don't let them know who we're calling. I'll, I'll sometimes let them pick. And, um, yeah, just gives them opportunity just in that moment. Like, man, I'm tired. It's at the end of a game. Like, can I step up mentally and sink this free throw? So we'll do that. And then we have just different fun games where we do, uh, you know, one-man army where I'll pick two captains and they get to, uh, you know, they pick their teams and then they go one-on-one. They call out who they want. We go through twice and whoever had the most wins, you know, wins. And we believe in competition for everything. So whether we're doing a shooting drill, whether we're doing a ball handling drill, whether we're doing, you know, offense, defense, everything's a competition, you know, and there's consequences for that, you know. Yeah. And typically the consequences that range from, you know, running to push-ups to sit-ups to shoot. I mean, we've got guys carry guys around. I mean, just there's just consequences. They have fun with it. So, so the static stretch at the end, you have them kind of just circle up and then yeah. somebody's leading it and then they're, are they doing like – like you talked about, are they doing static stretch on their quad, their hamstrings, their calves? What are they doing? Yes, yeah, so we try to hit every muscle. We try to do it twice. You know, I mean, they do everything, you know, from the back to the arms, the shoulders. Um, we do different things that try to help with, like, the knees and shoulders. We just see in angles where you see a lot of uh, injuries. So, again, just try to do a lot of injury prevention stuff. Uh, and then, obviously, you, you want to elongate a lot of those muscles because you want to loosen up that lactic acid. So, it just prevents soreness uh, and helps with the quicker recovery. So um, we have someone they circle up. We have a captain or two that lead it. They count it out and they get it going. Now, do you talk to them during that time, or when they get done, you bring them in and kind of talk to them to wrap up the practice? So what I try to do as a coach is I actually walk around. Me and my coaches, you know, we're I require me and my assistants. We walk around and just we we'll, we'll just chat to guys while they're stretching. Say, hey, here's what you did well today. You know, man, I'm really liking this. Or hey, you know what? Like I need this from you. You know, like you didn't bring the energy like we needed. And so just kind of that's where that that is more like just that one on one type stuff takes place there. Uh, you encouraging guys and then um, they do their two laps and then we break it down uh, as a team uh, and we get it going. You know, one thing that I've let them start doing a little bit of that they really enjoy is I'll let them have some music going during warm ups and cool down. And I don't know what I don't know what it is, but I, ever since I started doing that. I mean, they are on point. They're out there. Like, they're just ready to go. I don't know what it is. They just love the music, I guess. So I'm telling you, music, like I was mentioned on one of the podcasts, like I went to Michigan State practice, like uh, it was last year. I think it was last year. Yeah, last year. And they, they had music going before practice. And yeah. the kind of like, you know, the pre-practice stuff they were doing and getting after it. And it was just like yeah. the energy was, was high. And then Texas Tech this year when they uh, had a kind of shoot around and kind of preparing for a game, at mm-hmm. the end of it, they turned on the music and had it blaring. And yep. the kids, I mean, the players, the coaches, they're all, like, getting after it, having fun. Yes. It's that energy it brings. But music yes. does it. I mean, you know how it is. You turn on music, and it kind of gets your body vibrating in a certain it way, does. excited. 
if I go on about it. So like back in the day when I was growing up, coaches would not play music and do that. Yeah. But now I see more of them doing that, which the players really seem to like. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And so it's little things like that. I mean, it just gets a little bit more of the buy-in from the players too. Like they almost like they get to look forward to it. Cause I mean, for me, I love practices because I mean, my, they kind of mimic what I went through where I just love the competition. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't just, oh, hey, mind this drill. So I just liked the competition side. And you had that music to it. And I'm telling you, these guys, they'll, they'll, they'll jump through a brick wall for you with that music. Yeah. They'll, I, mean, I, I had a practice where I took it away from them for, uh, for, as a consequence. Uh, for, you know, just there's some of the, you know, some stuff they, they need to do better at. And, man, it was one of our best practices because they wanted it back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They wanted to get that going. So Here's, uh, here's one for you. A, a friend of mine, he's an assistant coach at Texas Tech for Chris Beard. So, it, yep. uh, you know, Coach Beard's huge in the country music, especially like mm. old, like kind of twangy country music, really? right? Okay. So, what he tells the guys, he's like, listen, we're going to have a mixture. We'll have mine and yours, right? You'll yeah. be able to play your music as well. But if we lose and we don't play yeah. well, whatever, it's all my music. I like, like that. You're going to listen to my music the whole after the, in the locker room, whatever. And he's like, you know, my buddy's like, yeah, it kind of motivates those guys. They're like, we don't want to listen to all his music. We want ours. So we've got to go out and perform. <laughs> Right. So it's little like, things uh, like that to get him motivated, man. Yeah. Little things like that. You'll be surprised how they're like, boom, let's do it. So let's go back to when you talked about practice. I want to go back to where you talked about after you did dynamic and skill work, you also said you did some positional breakdown type stuff. Yes. How does yes. that look like in your practice? Do you have like bigs and, and perimeter? Yeah. What do you do? I mean, it's crazy because, I mean, we used to call bigs and guards, but like, a lot of bigs now want to be guards, you know, so I do have one traditional big and a bunch of forwards is what we call them now. Uh, but, yeah, we'll split up to where it's bigs and forwards, and it kind of just depends what we're doing that day because there's been a couple of days where there's only been one big down there with the bigs coach because I took the forward for the guards uh, or my, my guards coach took them and uh, just to get the perimeter work. So it's really perimeter and inside work. You know, we'll even send guards down, some of our bigger guards to go down with the bigs just to work on different inside game. But a lot of it, what I do is I switch off offensive day, defensive day, and then we just try to break it down. For example, you know, uh, little things like um, we'll, we work on the drive and kick. So what's that look like, man? I drive and then moving with them. Am I gonna, am I gonna drift to the corner? You know, am I doing a crack back? You know, kind of like some of that Steph Curry action where he'll drive, they'll kick it back, and then that guy drives, and then Curry comes right behind him again and gets it back. I mean, we just try to work on that type of action just so they can feel it. Again, it's, it's, it's two on zero, and then we add a defense in there so they can get a feel of how do they read it in that moment. Yeah. Uh, and then we just do defense, you know, too. I mean, where it's like I have different drills, whether it's we, – we always try to teach it. So, like, some of the players are like, man, Coach, you say that every day. And I'm like, well, there's a reason why we want to reteach – teach, reteach, teach, and we just want you guys to understand here's what we're doing. So we had a, we had a, a flow we were kind of, you know, struggling with on-ball defense, you know, because part of that's pressuring them because you're in a gap. You want to pressure the ball. And so we were uh, pressuring, but we were getting beat a lot. And so we did, you know, a little, little drill called Alabama one-on-one. -on -one. And, man, I mean, we, we just get after that, but there's always consequences if you get beat. You know, and I don't mean consequence like What's well, Alabama one on one? Uh, Alabama one on one is you have a, a coach up top, or you could have a player or a student assistant up top of the ball, at the top of the key, and then you have uh, two players on each of the blocks, and they're facing you uh, up top as a coach. And what happens is you slap the ball. The player, let's say the player on the right side, the right block has to he flies out to the left wing, and the player that was on the left block has to go touch the right block and then close out to that player as I'm passing them the ball, and then they go one on one. And the whole point is you can't let them get a wide open shot off or get into the paint. So, how do you so score? if they get a wide open shot off and they miss and the defender gets a rebound, do they get deducted for giving up a wide open shot? Or that's one it? point for the offense. So like the offense gets to keep because it's make it, take it pretty much. The offense gets to keep it if they get to the paint or if they get a wide open shot. So and obviously they make it. They get that they get a the point there too. And so the competition is whoever scores the most points. So the whole point defensively is I need to get stops. We'll also flip it to where whoever gets the most stops also wins, depending on what we're working on that day. And what do you do? Like say winners and losers. What do you, what do you have like a loser for accountability? What do they do? Uh, different things. You know, um, there's always the debate of conditioning as a discipline, you know, but we'll run, you know, and us coaches, we'll get in with them. You know, we'll run. Uh, we do push-ups. We do sit-ups. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we'll do and it's different. quick, right? It's not that many. It's like you might be like five push-ups or whatever. You're doing it quick, and then you're moving on, right? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the consequence is 10 push-ups. For example, if you miss a layup in practice, whether you're just goofing around or we're in a game and you in, you go, or we're in a drill and you go up and someone you think you got fouled, but you didn't you miss a layup, you still owe me 10 push-ups. Uh, we'll do 25 sit-ups, and then usually it's either a down and back or, or suicide. What's uh, Now, at the beginning of practice, I've seen it before, like coaches have their practice plans, and they might have like a – you know, kind of a message of the day, like a, a quote of the yes, day, and yes. then they might have an yes. offense and defense emphasis. Do you do stuff like that? Yep, I do exactly that. Um, in fact, you know, our players are always they, – they like – you know how they like to joke with you, and they'll be like, all right, quote of the day. So, like, I'm a big John Wooden fan. I just love getting quotes. I mean, I've gotten quotes where I get them out of the newspaper, get them out of articles, uh, out of my devotions. It's one of those things where I have probably over 400 different quotes in the spreadsheet, and I just I, I don't randomly pick, but I kind of go through depending on where we're at in our season, how the team's doing, stuff like that. And I use it, and then it's, it's almost like it's just like a short devotion type thing. Of here's our point of emphasis today. Um, and so I have it always. It's at every single top of every practice plan I have. So for me, I use the Excel spreadsheet, and so I have about probably 10, 12, 13 tabs that break down each of the the things of practice, whether that's offense, whether that's situations, whether that's conditioning, uh, whether that's fundamental work, skill work, shooting, all that kind of stuff. And then I put it into a practice plan, and I have every single practice plan I've done for the last nine years because uh, I like to go back and look, hey, how did this work? I take notes. I put on the notes to the side just to see, like, hey, this really worked well with this group. This didn't work well. Um, and so, yeah, at the top of every practice plan is what practice number we're on, uh, our quote of the day, and then, yeah, we dive right into it. Something I, I coached with an individual league really coach named Fred Turner back in the day, and he was really big on quotes, themes, all that, like yes, John yes, Wood yes. and Bobby Knight. Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he would put it up on a board, like back mm -hmm. in the day we had dry erase board, you know, technology nowadays today, and then he would circle everybody up. Like we'd have everybody up and we'd all link up, like arms yeah. together linked up. Yeah. We're in this circle, like we're all together. And then he'd be like going like, Willie, what's the quote of the day? And yeah. Willie would have to say what the quote of the day was. If he didn't oh, wow. do it, we'd all do like, you know, push-ups or whatever. And then he'd be yeah, like, yeah. hey, Jim, what's the offensive emphasis of the day? And you'd have to repeat it. So what his, his mentality was is that when these kids come in the gym, they went yeah. and they looked and they noticed and they read and they understood what the theme, what, what the uh, emphasis was going to be today, and they better understand it. And if they didn't, when they got right. the circle, there's going to be accountability. Yes, so it's kind, yes, of, kind yes. of a cool deal where it made the, the kids like really – I uh, just didn't walk in and shrug it off. They actually knew that they had to go yeah. and understand what was going on. Um, going back, really like to, go, go ahead. But I, was I, was just, say, I really, I really like that. You know, I used to post my practice plans on the board. Uh, I never made them necessarily recite the quote day, but I posted it just so they could see. But you know, these young kids, they go and look. When's conditioning in? Oh my gosh, what are we doing here? And so what happened is a lot of guys would conserve energy. You know, and my whole thing was, first of all, I reserve the right to adjust things. If we're not doing something well, especially when we're in season and we're trying to get something down, especially let's say we're going against the zone, I may cut out a drill that I had planned and use that eight minutes to continue working on a current drill to make sure we're ready to go for, for that zone. Um, but they would just like, some of these kids have OCD where it's like, oh my gosh, you're one minute over what you said you were going to do. You know what I'm saying? Or man, I, I, I'm so stressed about doing conditioning. I got to wait to make sure I can finish on time and stuff. And so... I really just kind of – I stopped doing that so that they not, – not that I want to surprise them, but they can just focus on the moment. So whatever we're doing that moment, just bring it, you know, so. So going back to John Wooden, because that, I'm a huge fan of John Wooden as yeah. well, and, um, and something he talks about, as you know, it's like you said, is uh, planning that was so important to him, right? Right? He yes, talks yes. about, um, you know, failing to plan is preparing to fail, right? Like yep, yep. the idea – and so for him, they talked about like he'd spend over like an hour – just yeah, on his practice plan, you know, for that mm -hmm. day. And he would be going like, okay, we're going to have this group here, you know, basketballs, cones, whatever it is. Like he had everything laid out to where there wasn't a second in that practice plan. It wasn't allocated for. So do you, to make your practices very efficient, do you spend time like that? Like say 30 minutes, an hour before practice or the night before and looking at, okay, well, here's what we need to work on. And then do you break it down to where the assistant coach are doing this? I'm doing this. This group's here. Does it get real detailed? You know, it does. And, you know, I just want to say it, it kind of just depends on who you are as a coach. You know, I've talked to coaches that are really good that, I mean, literally they just write down a few things, you know, on a piece of paper and they're good to go and their practices still flow. You know, for me, I like to, like kind of you said, I just like to think it all out. I like to get intentional. Um, I mean, everywhere from like in each of those drills, I have it broken down like what the teams look like, what I'm trying to look for in that, what we want to try to get out of that. 
Um, and so that's very important to me. And so like you come to my practice, it's very up tempo. I just don't want to waste any time. Like I mentioned before, it's two hours and 15 minutes. I like to get in, get it done and then get out. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. consistency uh, for the players. But yeah, I will, what it typically happens is I, I write up the practice plan. Well, I'll even back it up. What happens is I have a brief about five, 10 minutes after practice with the coaches. Uh, you know, we're trying to get home to our families and have dinner and all that kind of stuff. So they'll give me their feedback. Here's what I like, coach. Here's what was good. And then um, depending on where we're at in the season, so if we're in like, you know, maybe earlier in the season, we don't have a game the next day. They just kind of tell me, here's what I feel like we need to work on or here's things we did well. I make a practice plan and then we have a meeting before practice so I can go through, here's what you're going to be running. Here's what I have you running. Here's the emphasis on this. Hey, even in this scrimmage, you know, I have it broken down here. Here's specifically what I want you to look at. I want you looking at, are they going hip tight on every screen that's set? If it's not, blow the whistle. And that's their whole job for that eight-minute scrimmage is to just blow the whistle every time someone doesn't go hip tight off the screen, where it's a ball screen, pin down, whatever it is. And so I like to just have that because I feel like that makes us better. Uh, I think the players appreciate that because they don't have to stress like, oh, man, are we going to go two and a half hours a day? Are we going three hours a day? They know exactly like we're getting in at this time. We're going to be done at this time. And I'm sure you have like a manager at the, uh, yes. you know, practice and you got the clock out to where you're basically be able to put yep. the time on the clock and do stuff like that. Is that what you, you have somebody doing that? Yeah, yeah. So I actually, I, I scholarship a manager. Um, they're on scholarship uh, for us because in my opinion, I don't care if you're a starter or you're at the end of the bench or you're a manager, every person plays a role and I need that role. And so like that manager is very vital to me because like I don't want to have to worry like did we get off our jerseys? Are the jerseys washed for practice? Do we have, you know, is the scoreboard ready to go? Like their charges get that. I show up, I give her, uh, this last year, I, the last couple of years I've had a, a female, I gave her the practice plan and she's supposed to have that time. So again, when I blow the whistle, that drill's done, boom, there should be a one minute on that clock going for water break. As soon as that thing goes on, boom, I need my 10 minutes up. I need that started just so we can get going. And to me, that's very important. You know, there's been a couple of days that she wasn't able to be there, and man, it threw off the flow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah. To me, that's very important. I mean, I I have to have a manager. I mean, this is just like having very good players. You, if you don't have it, it definitely affects you. So I, I definitely would encourage that for all coaches to have some type of manager. And you know what? There's play. Those people out there, they want to be a part of the team. They know that that role is important. And I treat it that way. For example, like her. She ate first on every restaurant that we went out to, you know, got all the gear. I mean, all the trips, like she was accountable. She still had to be at all the study halls. Like she was accountable just like all my other players. Cause I mean, to me, there's no different than a player. Like this is your responsibility. This is your job. And I need that. So I try to, I try to show the importance of that as well. So that, the players would also treat it like that too. So now do you ever film practice, like be able to go back and look at it? Or is that something that, that you do and you feel like it's beneficial or. Uh, yes. No, I haven't done it uh, the last couple of years uh, cause of my dual role. Um, as the uh, athletic director, I didn't have necessarily the time to break it down, um, but I have done it in past. Uh, I've done it both ways where I've filmed all of practice, and then I've also done it where I just filmed scrimmages. Um, very, both of them, you know, they serve their purpose. The, the main one for the whole practice was to help uh, coaches develop, you know, because at, at our level, a lot of the assistants coaches run the drills, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I'm able to kind of like what I do with breakthrough basketball. I'm able to walk around and I'm able to like make sure it's being done right and, and pull guys aside. Um, so they run the drill. So I was helping them from a teaching standpoint. And then also, man, every kid thinks that they should start these days. And so I would have film that I pull up and say, well, here's what I'm looking for. I need the effort, the energy. And I show them. I'm like, you're not, you're not bringing this. Or I have a six, nine guy that wants to shoot a bunch of threes in games. I'm like, dude, you're shooting like 20% in practice, you know, cause we would charge stats in practice as well. You know, especially in the scrimmages, and we gave him a plus minus at the end of every practice. You know, you know whether it was turnovers, um, you know, what I'm saying missed shots, all that kind of stuff. Because I mean, we, we value, we want them to understand we value every single moment, just like we do in a game. You know, and so uh, we did where we just did scrimmages as well, which I actually felt like that was the most effective, um, and that was able to be effective from just a, a player evaluation standpoint, from a stat keeping standpoint, you know, all that stuff. But I mean. I didn't, I haven't had the time to do it. And so like, if I'm not going to be able to do it well, I haven't done it recently. So, so what is, you feel like, okay, when the season gets going and you mentioned like sometimes you'll have, you know, two games in three days or, you know, whatever yeah, it might yeah. be and yeah. back to back, like what do you do in between say um, a practice in between a game you just had? Is it more of a walkthrough? You just do like shoot around. What do you do in those times, especially when the season gets going and kids, like I said, might be a little tired, um, yeah. the legs aren't as strong with what they've been doing throughout the year, need a little breather, get off their legs some, what do you do? 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I really have a big believer in the perceived uh, exertion rate um, where, you know, we're able to evaluate like where are they at from a physical standpoint, exertion rate on there. And so um, let's say, you know, we have a game. We've had games where we played Tuesday and we had to play, turn around and play Friday, Saturday, you know. And so what does that Wednesday, Thursday practice look like? And so, again, for me, it's still two hours, 50 minutes. I'm going to be straight up on you. That whole thing of, oh, man, I can't, I can't go hard. I can't do it. Dude, you're 18, 19, 20 years old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, we have you in good shape. But it also changes if they uh, kind of the intensity level. So as far as getting up and down, I mean, there's practices. We won't get up and down once. You know, a lot of it is just half court. A lot of it is one on zero. Um, a lot of it is, you know, when I say walk through, you know, people learn in different ways. And so we actually walk through five on five, maybe an opponent's plays and stuff like that so they can get it. We'll go live for maybe about 10 seconds of that, then we, we blow the whistle. And so, again, it's a, still a lot of uh, as far as the duration is the same, but as far as the exertion rate, we really try to cut back on that because, honestly, some of that is physical. But a lot of it's also mental now. Kids will be like, oh, man, I work so hard. I'm going to be dead tomorrow. My shot's going to be off. The reality is, no, your shot's not going to be off. It's kind of like the whole thing. Man, I can't lift. I can't lift because now my shot's going to throw my shot off. That's just not real. Science doesn't back that up. Um, it's more of a mindset. Now, obviously, you could overlift where you're exhausted. And yes, you, you may not be able to lift your arms. I get that. But as far as like lifting, uh, we'll lift the day before games and everything. And there's, there's no issue with that because it just depends on like what's the exertion rate. Um, so like my shoot arounds, same thing. You know, they're, they're exactly an hour and five minutes long. And they have to wear their practice gear because we go live. So we'll have a mini practice that morning um, before we have a game later that evening. Um, and again, it's just – once I got them past that mental side of that, feeling like, man, I'm going to be dead. I have people, if, we, if we're on the road and we're not able to have a shoot around, you know, that affects guys mentally. We're like, well, coach, I'm not going to be able to make anything. Like, like, we, haven't, we haven't gotten to the gym. We haven't walked through their plays, all that kind of stuff. All I have is their playbook in front of me. So it's really more of the mental side than it is the physical side. If that, if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I was wanting too on the mental side, you know, because basketball is a long season. I mean, it really is. From preseason to when you get in conditioning to when you get into actual practices before the, the season really starts. Um, so it's really long. So do you do anything like, say, emotionally, you know, they're, mentally they're drained? Do you do something where maybe you, hey, today, you know, you hear people talk about we're playing wiffle ball or playing kickball or we're doing like you know, football, whatever. We're doing something kind of fun today. Uh, maybe we're going for an hour, but we're going to do this afterwards. Uh, we're checking out going bowling. And what, what do you do maybe during the long – grueling season you feel like your players need a little mental break i mean i would say all all of what you just mentioned i mean we'll have it to where we'll do a, a games you know uh we try to make them all basketball related games i mean even just something as simple as knockout mm -hmm. <laughs> the guys just go crazy when you go do knockout so we try to do different things like that just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit um i'm telling you the number one thing for us is when i tell the guys you know because we usually do film before almost every practice especially in season whether it's watching ourselves or watching the opponent coming up and then i'll just be uh, i'll tell them like hey no practice today oh man they're just light up they think it's the greatest thing ever you know and so i mean and really i feel like that's won us a lot of games because they've now felt like man i'm rested i'm ready to go we're good and and honestly i, I talk to my captain sometimes ahead of time they'll go do their i don't know you know, their 2K tournaments or Fortnite or whatever video game it is, they'll go do that. Um, I've also had it to where we'll do practice, but then I invite them over for dinner. So my wife will do a home-cooked meal for them. You know, we'll watch a game that night, whether it's the NBA or a college game. And, again, it's just more of just a relaxed-type atmosphere uh, just to get their minds where they can just, like, take that deep breath off of homework or maybe they don't feel like they're playing well or maybe we're in a losing strong or maybe we're doing really well and they feel the pressure, but just to be able to relax a little bit. But I mean, so honestly, I've tried almost all those things and it's just about timing. You know, I mean, I have a strong leadership group, especially returning. And so I'll literally just ask them like, Hey, what, what's kind of the, what's kind of the, the mood of the team? You know, what's, what's, how are they doing right now? You know I mean? And they'll tell me like, Hey, a few guys are struggling. Well, that's different. That, that's more of a one-on-one -on -one type conversation. But if it's like, man, a lot of guys are struggling or they're tired or da 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 then that's where I try to take, you know, I may change my practice plan or something like that just to get that mood going. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you can practice, 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 but if they're not there mentally, you're not getting anywhere. So going back to that, like developing these practices and say, you know, every coach like yourself, you have philosophy. Philosophy right. of, you know, how we're going to play from offense, half court, to transition, to defense, right. Um, right. you know, whatever, whatever it's going to be. I mean, 
So, you know, and getting kids to come in to buy, buy into like the philosophy that you're implementing on a daily basis and practice through these plans. Do you have any suggestions of how you get the kids to truly like, cause there's so much stuff information out there, right? There's like yes. I talk about, there's many ways to skin a cat. And then some of these kids come from maybe, uh, you know, junior college or high school, different ones. Yeah. And they've been coached yeah. maybe spring, summer basketball by people and think certain ideas are the best way. So what would you suggest to, to coaches to be able to do certain things to get them to understand what we're doing works and this is what we're about and to get them to buy into it? Yeah, I'd say there's, there's, a, few, there's a few things with that. Um, one is, you know, um, when you're recruiting or even you know, whether it's high school, even middle school, is you got to have a vision, you know. And the big thing is I hate to use the word sell you on the vision, but if I can help you see what my vision is, um, that's where you start taking that first step. And then the second part is getting to know what is their vision or goals. So when I'm recruiting, I mean, I'm telling them on our vision, hey, here's what I want the program to be in the next year, three years, five years, 10 years. And here's how I envision you playing a role in that. But then I always ask them, what's your plan? Where, where's your five-year plan? Where do you want to see yourself? You know, uh, and you can really do that at any level. You know, I always do like, where do you see yourself when the season started? You know, and almost all of them say, I want to start, I want to make all region, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so helping understand, I mean, for my level, you know, what I deal with a lot is uh, a lot of guys say, well, I want to, I want to play professionally. <laughs> yeah. And I just really like, I don't want to crush your dream, but I also want to be, I want to be someone that can be real with you and say, here's what this really would look like, uh, the business side of that. And, but here's what my vision for you and for this looks like. Uh, I think that plays a big role. I mean, cause it's just, it's just developing relationship and being honest. You know, sometimes being honest is telling a player what they don't want to hear. But if you've built up that relationship, they trust you. They'll, they'll be bought into that. Um, and then, you know, I was going to I was going to say the, the other aspect of that is just leadership on the team. Um, man, like I told you a couple years, ago, I brought in 15 freshmen and had three upperclassmen, uh, two juniors and uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, two juniors and one sophomore. It was tough. I mean, it reminded me of my very first year of coaching back, you know, what, eight years ago when I had my first college team. And it, it was really tough because we didn't have a leadership on the court. So, like, these guys were just, you know, they'd be like, squirrel, you know, and they're just going wherever direction. But, you know, when you have established leaders and you've now built them up, I mean, those guys now are going to be juniors and seniors for me now. Uh, they've been in the program. They understand it. There's things they love about it. There's things they don't love about it. But the number one thing is they know that they can come talk to me, and they have my back no matter what. I mean, you know, there's always going to be players that don't like this. They don't like this. They want this. But when you get players that really are bought in like that, where they have your back, because they know you know what's best for them, or you want what's best for them, um, that really filters all the way down to your freshmen, to your incomers. And you start to see that in your practices. We do fundraising events. And there's guys like, I don't really want to go do this. And those leaders really kind of step in. And like it just really helps change the attitude and mood to where it's less of them doing it for me and more of them doing it because they bought into the program. You know, I, this is a fairly new program here, not to get on a bunny trail, but here's an example. Uh, you know, we, we don't, I don't have a gym on campus right now. You know, uh, we're a brand new program that just started up two years ago. Um, and I always tell players, hey, I can't, we're not the type of program to say, hey, come here and be a part of our tradition. We've won so many championships and all this kind of stuff. But I say to them, hey, why don't you come here and help me build this tradition? Again, that's just setting a vision for them and what we're trying to accomplish. And I'll be honest with you, some players are on board with that and some aren't. And the players that aren't on board on that, they're not here. You know, and the players that are on board on that, because they're going to understand through the struggle of the season when we maybe lose a few games or maybe we've struggled with, you know, we've got to drive the snow to practice and all that kind of stuff. There's going to be less complaining. There's more like, hey, this is just what we do. We're owning this. And that's life. I mean, yeah. I love my job, but there's things about it that drive me absolutely insane, <laughs> you know? But I love what I do. And so, like, just helping them understand that. So, again, I know it's a little bit long-winded, but I think with those coaches, if they can just build a relationship, excuse me, if they can give the vision, they can build a relationship and then develop leaders on the team, it's going to really help with your buy-in. No, I like that because I think, too, once you understand what it is they want, then you can explain to them how you can help them get it through the right. program and what you're doing. So the philosophy of maybe conception of what you're doing, hey, this is how this works to help you. So if they see the benefit of them as well, they see the value of it, and like you said, and then you got the leaders that believe in you and the philosophy they're bought in. They're going to get those other ones to understand the value of it well, to get them to focus on the things, the kind of the main thing, right? Not get lost outside of things that distract you from it and get them focused to do the things on a daily basis. It's going to get them where they want to be. So now as we wrap up this, we get into something called the trifecta. So I'm going to ask you okay. three questions. All right. um, and I know you'll answer, well, there's no right or wrong answer to it. So feel comfortable about it. 
Coach Willie. So the first one is this. Um, what I'm big into habits, and I believe habits can, you know, instill success in someone's life. And yeah. there's negative and there's positive habits. So what is one positive habit that you would say that you have in your life that you would encourage anyone to have that can help them succeed as well? What would it be? Oh, man. I mean, there, I would say I have a few of them that I've developed over years. But, I mean, number one is just hard work. Um, again, this isn't me bragging or anything, but, I mean, I'm one of the youngest ADs here in the region, um, Edmond basketball coaches. I mean, my counterparts, we're actually a merger with Hope International University. My counterparts in the 60s out there in California. Uh, but I've just worked hard. And I think a lot of that came. I had the experience of living inner city for a while. And then I lived on a farm for eight years. And so – that's out of the country, oh you know? um, and so it was it, the opposite ends of the spectrum. But hard work and hard work, I always add consistent hard work. You know, I mean, it doesn't just take a day off. And I'm not saying overworking yourself, but just bringing it every day. And so consistency with that. So that would be my answer to you, my moose off the top of my head. Yeah, you sound like somebody that's like, I'm going to do more than what's expected of me, right? I'm going to get right. more than what they expect to create even more value with what I do. Right. I mean, I just don't look at it as a as an eight to five type thing. I look at it as a twenty four hours. You know, I mean, just what's that look like for my twenty four hours for this day? You know, and so a lot of people like to say, like, "Oh, I want to flip a switch, flip it on, flip it off," and it just I believe the switch is always on. So the second question is, what would be a book that you've read, a video you've watched, an audio you've heard, something that's made a tremendous impact in your life that you'd encourage somebody else? to read, watch, or listen to as well? Man, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, if I had to think about it a little bit more, I have a different answer, but, you know, um, yeah, I know. John, John Wooden, um, you know, he's just influential in so many different ways. And, you know, we're, we're a faith-based school here as, as a Nebraska Christian college. And so, like, for me, it's been from going from a player to a coach but now having purpose as a coach, does that make sense? I had the privilege of winning regional championship my first three years of coaching. Um, obviously, I didn't win the national championship, but competed in the national tournament. And, like, I just kind of felt empty, if that kind of makes sense. Like, there, was, I wanted more to just, just winning. Like, I, I enjoyed the winning. But then as soon as we'd win, about 10 minutes later, it's like, okay, I'm already thinking about the next game. What do I got to do to do that so I can have that feeling? And uh, one of the things that really helped me is, like, this became – developed into a ministry – you know, as I start to see some of my players, we're asking my kids to be in their weddings. Um, you know what I'm saying? As I'm able to, like, be references from the guys. Guys still keep reaching out to me. I've been, I've, we've gone to so many weddings. Uh, it's one of those things where it's like, man, this is, this is more than just winning and losing. Like, I'm one of the most competitive people is more than just winning and losing. Um, and so one of the things I get, uh, I believe it sends me every week, every two weeks, is uh, it's called Wooden's Newsletter. It's Wooden's Newsletter? Hmm? Wooden's Newsletter? Wooden's newsletter. Yep. Yep. And, uh, what it is, is this guy from a Christian perspective just breaks down everything John Wooden, you know, I mean, right now he's going through the pyramid of success. Everyone's heard of that, but just breaking it down from another perspective. And, uh, again, it's just, I really enjoy it. It, it takes about five minutes. I read, I get quotes from it. Uh, I actually send snippets to my, my leaders. So I have a leaders uh, group chat. I'll send it to just to kind of just say, Hey, man, this was a good read. Here's this. And so again, it's not like this long book or anything, but it's just, I get it in an email and I, I just enjoy quiet time and reading. It. And so, uh, yeah, Woods newsletter. Uh, I would, I would just recommend that, you know, something that's like a regularly uh, sent to you. So the third one is this is what has a coach, a mentor or someone in your life, a uh, guardian, whatever it might be, that gave you maybe a message, maybe it's a quote or something that's, that's like, it's ingrained in you. And you live it out each and every day, and it's something that you feel like is a part of you. What would that be? Yeah, um, you're very familiar, uh, familiar with it. Philippians 4.13, you know, um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, it's one of those things where, like, my high school coach gave that to me. Um, I ended up got – that was actually my first coaching gig. I did a volunteer varsity coach for him. And, uh, you know, just a very godly man, coach, loves to win. And I just learned a lot from him. And so I actually still – he gave me a picture uh, when I was a junior in high school of me, and it had that verse on there. And it was one of those things it's just like, man, uh, it's still on my, it's on my dresser to this day. Um, I'm still in regular contact. And we actually go to the same church and stuff now too. And so it's one of those things where 
Uh, is just someone that poured into me more than just basketball. Um, and so I'm a big fan of having mentors and people that have life experiences. Uh, you know, I have another, my college coach I meet with once a month. Um, and so it's just one of those things where, man, uh, those guys, they just, they, they pour, they pour, and they keep doing it, and they do it selflessly. You know what I'm saying? They do it because they want to see you succeed. Um, and that's something now that's kind of, again, as I've matured, something that I've been trying to pass on to my, my own players. And, you know, as I see it more than just winning and losing, it's more than like, man, how does this translate to life? So that's, it. that's, that's what it is for me. That's awesome. Well, I want to say Breakthrough Basketball, we are very thankful that we have you part of our family leading camps because, as like you talked about, having a, an AD at a college and a head basketball coach and have had the success only as a player but as a coach as well and being able to bring that into gymnasiums and help kids throughout the country, it's, it's awesome to have you on board. So I would tell anyone that has an opportunity, like I said, that you can go on to – you know, Coach Williams' uh, link page and be able to sit there and yeah. see what camps he's doing. And I would sign up and get to camp because I'm. I, when you can have a college coach working with you at a camp. I mean, that's that's an incredible thing to be able to have. It's true value. So, and the listeners that have listened, we hope that you gained a lot of insight through the show. And we'd ask you just, uh, you know, please do us a favor. Give us a, a rating, a review, like on iTunes, and visit uh, www.breakthroughbasketball and then uh, .com and slash camps to find more information on our skill development camps. And Willie, Coach Coach Williams, we appreciate your time and the value you brought today. And I wish you the best throughout the recruiting season right now and into 2019 and 20 to have a a great, uh, rewarding season. Appreciate it. Thank you, Coach. Take care and God bless. Be good. Thank you for listening to the Breakthrough Basketball Coaching Lab with Jim Huber. Visit us at www.breakthroughbasketball.com for world-class resources for players and coaches of all skill levels.